Yes. We'll be beginning in just a few more seconds. So get situated. Make sure you have a glass of water or a cup of tea or whatever you need. I um I grabbed a little bit of my sweet honey in the rock. I needed a little bit of their vibes right now, so really grateful. All right, so we are going to get started. And um, again, welcome, welcome to all of you. I wish you could see each other because we have a beautiful, beautiful crowd this <laughs> evening. And just so we're so grateful. This is just so beautiful. I don't even have the words to speak. So I'm just going to give thanks and start off our our webinar as we always do. And we do that by just giving thanks and honoring um, this space that we're creating together and taking a moment to ground ourselves. Again, I know so many of us have come from so many different places and so many walks of life. And I don't know how your day was, but hopefully it was all right. And hopefully it's gonna get even better um, as we share this space. So wherever you are, just take a moment. And if you're able to have your feet flat on the ground, let them connect to the earth. And as Mama Earth just pulls us to her through gravity, we can just connect and feel that grounding. And together we can take a deep breath. So let's inhale together and exhale. If you'd like to have your hand on your belly and maybe one on your heart to just feel an even deeper connection, please do so. And let's breathe in again together and exhale. And again, inhale. And exhale. And we do this, we give thanks always for all of these things, for our breath, for this beautiful earth that we have our, that nourishes us and sustains us and just so much gratitude for for being here for life. And, you know, it's so difficult because we're so separate from each other in so many ways, but we're able to gather virtually and that's, that's really powerful. And so we want to just slow down and connect and reconnect and just remember those whose shoulders we stand upon. We want to remember our ancestors, whether they're personal or our ancestor heroes. Let's just remember those who came before us and just give thanks for those lessons of courage and wisdom that they share. And remember, and we have right here with us a woman who just has shared so much courage and gives us so much courage. And she's with us right now. And that is such an honor. And I just want to give thanks right now for that. As we continue to breathe deeply with our feet on the ground and just grounding to the earth, we want to give thanks for the nourishment that she provides and the bounty and this place that we call home. And as we're giving thanks, we have to remember, we have to remember the first people of this land, those who came before us. And so we want to honor them and we want to acknowledge the people that whose lands we stand upon. I'm in Philadelphia, so I'm on the Lenny Lenape lands. And um, if you do not know where um, you, what, whose territory you're on, please feel free to check it out. Shia is gonna post in our chat. You can go to native-land.ca forward slash, and you can find out where you, whose lands you're standing upon right now. And, and hopefully that will help you just acknowledge and give thanks. And, you know, we wanna do more than just give thanks, right? So we wanna make sure that we're doing, we're connecting with the people whose, 
whose lands are that we're on and really, um, you know, doing anything that we can to just erase, you know, this colonizing mentality that has been adopted and, um, and that we're all faced with. So let's, let's work on erasing that and really, you know, connect with the indigenous land, connect with um, the people, the groups that are fighting for indigenous land and food sovereignty and do more than acknowledge. So we've got a lot of groups. You can go to our website and check them out. A lot of groups that you can support that are doing this work this in, in food sovereignty and land sovereignty. And we're gonna find out more about that now. Um, so hopefully everyone is now grounded and we, um, we have a couple announcements. So just, you know, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Malika Gilpin and I am the conference manager for NISOG. And um, I wanna just say, do a little, a couple shout outs. We've got so many of our board members on tonight. Um, and I wanna just shout out our amazing staff who, um, in particular, Hoshia, who really like just is behind the scenes, but you can see her now and she is pulling this all together and making sure that we're all on track and that we can all hear each other and all those beautiful things. So I'm really grateful um, for all of you for joining us. And tonight I'm excited um, because uh, not only um, do we have the amazing Miss Shirley Sherrod with us, but you know our whole staff is really coming together to um, present this webinar. And we started the Sankofa series because, as all of the you know conferences got canceled, we're like, you know, we've got to keep bringing programming to our folks, you know, it's now it's so important now more than ever, we need to bring important content. And so that's how the Sankofa series was born. I was just thinking like, hey, it would be really great if we, you know, just gathered all of this knowledge and we're, we could reshare some of the um, folks that have presented at NISOG conferences in the past. And so Sankofa, for those of you who don't know, Sankofa is an Akan word from um, Ghana, and it means to go back and fetch it. And this term refers to the idea of, of gathering the wisdom of the past and using it to help us to move forward into the future. And so tonight we are going to do this again. And um, we have, Mrs. Sherrod with us who will be sharing so much wisdom. But before we go into that, we have a couple of things that we wanna go over with you all. So I'm gonna turn it over to Hoshia who will share a little bit more. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, thank you for that introduction. My name is Shia, I use she, her pronouns um, and I'm the program assistant at NISOG. Um, I just want to go over quickly um, some community agreements and some Zoom etiquette just so we can all get on the same page um, and make sure that we're creating a safe space for everybody. Um, so give me one moment so we can pull that up. Um, okay. All righty. So to start, be curious, open, and respectful. Call in, not out. Throw sunshine, not shade. No one knows everything. Together, we know a lot. We can't be articulate all the time, so give people the benefit of the doubt and be sure to ask questions. Take care of yourselves. Stretch, eat, drink, use the restroom, etc. Confidentiality. Don't speak for others without explicit permission and don't share something that's communicated in a private space. One mic, one voice at a time, make space and take, and take space. And if you're usually a quiet person, challenge yourself to go out of your comfort zone a little bit. And if you're someone who usually talks a lot, try to make spaces for quieter voices. Um, avoid jargon, acronyms, industry language, try to use inclusive language um, so it can be accessible for everyone. 
be aware of time. Uh, speak from your own experience. Use I statements rather than generalizations. Challenge assumptions. Be conscious of intent versus impact. No matter your intention, you're responsible for your impact. Avoid using isms without explaining what you mean by them. Expect and accept non-closure. This work takes time. We are planting seeds knowing that we won't be able to harvest them right now. Um, so those are our agreements that we try to move by. Um, next here, we have Zoom etiquette. Uh, be present, stay engaged. We have an amazing speaker with us today. So let's give her the attention and respect she deserves. Um, and let's give each other the attention um, and respect we all deserve. Uh, this is a recording, so it will be available um, and we will have Spanish translation available soon as well. Um, feel free to add your names and your pronouns. We want to see who's joining us. Um, you guys are coming from all over, so it's really nice to see where everyone's coming from and, and who is all here with us. Um, use the chat box, engage with each other, share your comments, ask questions, take care of yourself. This webinar is an hour and a half long, so stay hydrated, get a snack, use the restroom, whatever you got to do. Um, and we'll take questions at the end. So if you have any, you can drop them in the chat box. Um, and I just wanna quickly share this uh, really helpful infographic to reference if you should ask a question or not. Um, this is really helpful. You can use it, you can take a, a snapshot of it, um, but I find it a good resource, especially in the age when we are using a lot of virtual spaces um, and, and on Zoom every day and things like that. So. Um, I'll drop the, the link for that in the chat box. Um, and then next, I want to send it over to Heber Brown, Pastor Heber Brown, um, one of our lovely, lovely board members um, who did one of our Sankofa webinars. So he's, he's an alum here, <laughs> um, but we thank him for his time and I'm going to pass it over to him now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Shia. I appreciate that uh, introduction. And I'm really excited to be with you all today. Um, I, I'm like, Shia, I'm looking at all these uh, names on this list of attendees and am very much so excited to see so many that I know and a uh, list of other names that I'm not quite as familiar with. So can we do a little bit of a shout out? Where, where are you in the world? Just put in the chat box, where are you in the world? Uh, so that we can know uh, where you are and then kind of get a sense of the magnitude of this august congregation tonight uh, as we prepare for this. Look at this. Uh, uh -huh, New York's in the house. Connecticut is here. All right, Massachusetts. Lord have mercy. Okay, y'all are good. Uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Buffalo's in the house. Uh, uh -huh, North Carolina. Beautiful, beautiful. Atlanta, Georgia. Baltimore, Maryland. Come on in, cuz. Uh, grateful for you. Brooklyn's in the house. All right. Cherokee land in West Virginia. Welcome, Victoria. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Eric in Washington, D.C. Welcome, welcome. Gary, Pennsylvania. Hey, Gary. Philly's in the house. Awesome, awesome, beautiful. Thank all of you so very much. As you can see, we're all over the place. Northeast, Southeast, uh, this is wonderful, and I'm, I appreciate just the opportunity. Kingston, Jamaica's in the house. Come on now. Welcome, welcome, Melanie. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you and all the cousins, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Well, I am so grateful to be a board member of the Black... I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. All these Zooms. I am a part of the Black Church Food Security Network, but tonight and in this setting, I'm grateful to be a board member of NISOG. And of course, they would ask uh, the Black Baptist preacher to do offering before the speaker. Uh, <laughs> and so that's my task tonight. I want to invite you. Uh, my brother Eric is here. What's up, man? I want to invite you uh, to prepare for those who are in position to support. Uh, we want to invite you to come forward uh, because this is offering time. Um, they shared with me that uh, we've made enough with revenue 
from this event plus previous revenue to cover costs for this webinar. So we'll be putting all additional revenue towards youth programming, which we are currently and actively fundraising for. We're putting all of our Sankofa revenue after expenses towards expanding youth programs and our annual appeal, which we exceeded by 30%, is also going towards youth programs as well. Some uh, specifics of our youth program that funds will strengthen. Well, if you are able to put some financial support in play tonight, uh, your support will go to strengthen the awesome youth design and youth led sessions at our conference scholarships for youth to attend our conference, whether it's in person or online, seeding a youth food justice network in the Northeast, support for youth to have watch parties for the conference if online. Plus, things we are raising money for include stipends for youth who help to plan our conference, a youth peer mentorship program, and stipends for youth writers. Uh, so essentially, family, we are inviting your financial support so that we can uh, put that support behind our young people and ensure that the pipeline for the change makers and the freedom fighters long into the future is there and that NISOG is doing its part uh, to lay good ground for the blossoming of the geniuses around us, the young people that we're blessed to be in community with as well. Tracy gave me a charge uh, to see if we could raise uh, $500 tonight and in fact, Tracy, I'm actually going to change the number to $400. I'm putting up $100 tonight uh, in support of our young people and in support of the wonderful programming of NISOG. So I pledge that tonight. And if any others could join, match, beat, or meet uh, what I have, we invite you to please join us too. You can send donations to nisog.org forward slash donate nisog.org forward slash donate, and we would love your support toward this effort. I thank you in advance uh, for your support. That's right, join, match, meet, or be. Uh, I'm putting up 100, and for those who are in position to do whatever it is that you're able to do, we will greatly appreciate your partnership and your solidarity in this important effort. Now, allow me to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for the night. I am so excited about tonight's gathering and tonight's keynote speaker. Mrs. Shirley Sherrod is a Baker County, Georgia native who grew up on her family's farm. In March 1965, her father was murdered by a white farmer who was not prosecuted. The tragic murder of her father when she was 17 years old had a profound impact on her life and led to her decision to stay in the South to work for change. Mrs. Sherrod helped to start the civil rights movement in Baker County and later married Reverend Charles Sherrod, one of the founding members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and leader of SNCC's work in Southwest Georgia. With her husband and others, she helped to form New Communities Incorporated, the first community land trust in the United States. New Community serves as a laboratory and model in the movement toward the development of community land trusts throughout the country. There are more than 200 community land trusts today. Mrs. Sherrod has a BA in sociology from Albany State University in Albany, Georgia and an MA in Community Development from Antioch University in Yellow Springs, Ohio. In 2015, she was awarded an Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from Sojourner Douglas College right here in Baltimore, Maryland. She has received many awards for her work in civil rights and as an advocate for farmers and rural residents. In, 20, in 2009, uh, Mrs. Sherrod was appointed by the Obama administration as USDA Georgia State Director of Rural Development. She became the first person of color to hold the position. Mrs. Sherrod was forced to resign her position in 2010 after conservative blogger Andrew Breitbart edited a speech she made at an NAACP banquet to make it appear uh, that she discriminated against a white farmer while serving uh, in her federally appointed position. Subsequent events show that Breitbart's edited video was taken out of context and was part of a broader 
part of broader comments that conveyed a completely different meaning. USDA Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack apologized and offered her another position, which she declined. Mrs. Sherrod serves as the Executive Director of the Southwest Georgia Project for Community Education Incorporated, Vice President for Development for New Communities Incorporated, and State Lead for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative for Economic and Social Justice. Mrs. Sherrod and Reverend Sherrod have two children and five granddaughters. At this point in Black Baptist Church spaces, the preacher would usually say, sit back, relax, and prepare for a mighty word from the Lord. Uh, and we are about to receive, in my view, a mighty word from the Lord. But the last thing I want you to do is sit back and relax. I actually invite you to lean in and come forward so that this keynote presentation uh, is even more than a presentation, but also marching orders that this takes on an organizing feel tonight. I have a hunch it will, because these are the kinds of times where we have to have all hands on deck. Uh, just because a new administration has come in does not mean the work is over. And so lean in, let's get ready, get your pen, get your pad, and let's learn together uh, from the one and only. Please help me welcome Mrs. Shirley Sherrod. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you went, and I want to say it's it's good to be with everyone again. Um, the last time I think was in 2015 uh, when I was there. I, I was trying to remember whether there was snow or not. You know, I'm from the South and I don't do too well with snow. So this works out really well for me. <laughs> As you were introducing me, normally I said, gosh, I sent the, I guess I sent the longer version because I didn't mean to do that. I have a really short one. <laughs> but uh, during that introduction, it really helped me to think about so many storms um, dating back to, to 1965. Um, some of you have probably heard me talk before about growing up on a farm, you know, picking cotton, you know, whenever I think about it, you know, in those early years, you had to, we had to even pump water because we didn't have an electric well. <laughs> we had to pump water, not only for our use in, in the house, but for the animals as well. So life was not all that great. I didn't realize how good it was until many, many years later. All I could do, especially as I worked in the cotton field, was to plan my life away from the farm and the South. I would dream of my days um, and how I would get away from there as I, as I worked on the farm and had no idea, you know, I knew we were dealing with storms, storms were raging, we were having to deal with, with the sheriff who would murder people, we'd have to deal with other white people who would murder people in our county. And I would observe uh, people in the county helping folks to get away, you know, to leave, to leave forever, uh, because they couldn't live there, but I didn't you know, I just, I, I kept myself to the point where I didn't dwell on it because I planned to get away from it. Um, so the storms were raging and all I could think of was just let me get out of high school. I'm getting as far away from this. I'm getting as far away from that farm and from the South as I could go. I, um, I couldn't share that with my, my family. So I was secretly making these plans, but the storm was raging and I didn't know, but things were going so well. Sometimes, you know, the darkest time is just before the dawn. Well, we were having such a, I mean, the farm was uh, going well, we were making money. My father was having a new home built for us to move into. I was about to graduate from high school and everybody was happy because I'm the oldest. And uh, my father had convinced my mother to try one more time for this boy. Now, he and my mother had had five girls. You know, as a farmer, he wanted a son, but he, he loved these daughters. 
and we all had boys, uh, our nicknames were boys' names. That was Bill. So he made us boys, but he wanted a son. So we all really, really happy, and, and all I could think of, let me get out of here to college. I will not make this place my life. Um, and there were many reasons. You know, I grew up in the, in the Jim Crow era where we had segregated schools. Everything was segregated. You had to be really, really careful around white people because they could do things to you um, and, and would never be held, account, held into account for it. So as we am going through this and things are going so well, the storm came. Um, my father was murdered by a white farmer who wasn't prosecuted. He actually lived 10 days after being uh, shot. And, um, and then my father died. My, he had convinced my mother to try one last time for this boy. So my mother was seven months pregnant. Now, when the doctor confirmed her pregnancy, uh, my father was giving out cigars because he said, this is the boy. He was having a special room built in the house for the boy. Um, but my mother was seven months pregnant and there were five girls. And, um, and as people would do, they, people, folks showed up at our house to try to comfort us, but I didn't want to be around anyone. I just had to get away from everyone because I felt I needed to do something. I needed to do something. You know, the storm was raging and, and I just felt I had to do something. So I went into one of the, the bedrooms and uh, closed myself off from everyone. And I was praying and asking God to help me, help me figure out what to do. And I can remember there was a, 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 I can remember a bright moon, so I don't know whether it was full or not, but I'm sitting there looking out the window and praying. And all of a sudden the thought came to me and I know now it was God talking to me. He said, the, the thought was, you can give up your dream of living your life in the North. You can stay in the South and devote your life to working for change. And I can remember feeling a calmness. I had no idea, no idea how I would do it, but I made a commitment that night at the age of 17 that I would stay in the South and devote my life to working for change. Um, my brother was actually born on my high school graduation day, <laughs> you know, so my father had called that one just right. And in June, we started the Baker County movement with the help of people from SNCC. Now, you would have to know more about Baker County. See, this storm just wouldn't, wouldn't stop. It was, you know, my father was dead. The baby came, that was a bright time. You know, that was a little calmness, but there was so much more to do. And as I attended my first mass meeting, I, could, I couldn't do anything but cry because I knew that this was one way I could live to be true to the commitment that I made, starting with the civil rights movement. Um, you know, when a storm is raging all around you, you have to do kind of like what I did. I had to go to a quiet place. I had to think, I had to try to be, you know, um, with God, I had to find that calm place so I could think and plan. And, and um, so I started with the civil rights movement and, um, and ended up marrying Charles Sherrod, who was one of the founding members of Slick, SNCC. <laughs> and that really set the course for my life's work. Uh, the organizing we did in Baker County, the organizing we did throughout Southwest Georgia led to many, many, many more years of work. So when the storm is raging, you know, sometimes you have to get right in it to try to deal with it. But at other times you need to sit back and listen, listen to your heart, listen to your mind, listen to others as you begin to figure out just what it is you need to do. Now, if anyone had told me <laughs> prior to my father's death that I would be dealing with agriculture, that I would be 
organizing farmers, I would have said, oh no, you got me wrong. I probably will be living in New York, maybe even Massachusetts or somewhere, but not here in the farm. But I, I tell young people all the time, you can never say what you won't do. And I found myself sometimes organizing farmers and I would be trying to, you know, they here I am, I'm, I was very young and uh, the first co-op I organized was um, in Baker County where we lived. So these were all my father's friends. And, and what could I tell them? Well, I had to teach them a few lessons. You know, I had to let them feel the storm, <laughs> the storm that was coming after them to try to help them uh, move to a better place, uh, move to a more profitable operation move toward working together because that's not what they were doing they would we would show up at church and you see the men standing at the back of their pickup truck talking but they wouldn't share the successes they would have for example growing peanuts if they had a successful crop they talk about everything but wouldn't say what they did you know to get that so you know in those early years as i was moving through the storm that i had been been placed into with the murder of my father, I found myself many, many, many times going to my favorite uh, scripture. And I didn't intend, Reverend, I was so glad that you were here. I just didn't know how much of this I needed to, <laughs> to share. Uh, but the 27th Psalm, you know, and I have had to repeat that so, so many times through the years as I've dealt with one storm after another. You know, I can remember when my grandmother um, was living and we were young kids and there would be these thunderstorms and lightning storms and she would make us turn all the lights out and sit in the dark. And she was saying, let God do his work. You know, so sometimes as we are dealing with storms, we have to just sit back and let God do his work. Now, as the, 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 the storms raged, uh, you know, after 50, 60 years almost of doing this work, there's so many examples I can give you, but um, I can go on from one to the other in terms of my organizing, but I'd rather stick with some dealing with, with, with farmers. Um, we face so much discrimination here. There was a, um, an auction market in Thomasville, Georgia. Black farmers couldn't get their products sold there. If they took it, it was like giving it away, but white farmers could go through and get their, um, get a great price for theirs. How do we know? Sometimes they, one of the black farmers would get uh, a white farmer to take some of his produce uh, to the market. But their products were being sold there all the time because they were growing them. I remember in the case of one farmer, uh, Larry O'Neill. Larry would plant, plant 20 acres of, of um, turnip greens. And then let this white guy come in and, and uh, harvest them for a dollar a box. In that box might be six bunches of greens or in some cases 12, but he couldn't sell them. And uh, he was actually, so the, their product was being sold there, but they couldn't get money for it. Um, they couldn't get money on the market for it. Uh, so how do you deal, you know, this is, a, this is part of what has held black farmers back through the years. So what do you do about it? This is another storm. You know, you have to look at what's possible. You have to look at the connections that you have um, in terms of trying to see if sales can be made outside of the area because you couldn't break through this lockdown system they had here in Southwest Georgia. Um, so, you know, in the, in, the, in the storm, you look around and you see who can help you move through the storm or move out of the storm. So I've had to do a lot of that through the years and it was important. The connections we made uh, right there in, in Massachusetts, 
where we connected with the organizations there, Red Tomato, main organization. They would work on getting markets for us in, in Boston. And uh, I remember, I have to tell you this little thing, I, I, I was the only female that did, that uh, managed the Federation's work in a state. So I was like the state director for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. All of the others were guys. And they kept, we kept coming to a staff meeting and I would hear about this um, watermelon project that they were doing with um, Red Tomato. And I kept saying, how can my farmers get on, in on this? And they just locked me out. You know, these were guys, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina. And then the springtime came and uh, watermelon season. And I just happened to go in the office one Saturday morning and Betty McKenzie from Red Tomato was making a frantic call to me saying, surely, um, you know, the guys from the Federation had promised they would have the seedless melons. They would um, have a, a tractor trailer load here in Boston on Tuesday. This was Saturday. And they had no melons. They didn't have any at all. So she asked me, would you, do you have any? Well, we were actually helping some of our farmers load trucks down in, in Thomasville, Georgia, in Boston, Georgia, actually. And um, I said, well, we can get some to you, but they have seeds in them. They are not seedless. She said, we need watermelons. So where these guys locked me out of that project, um, our farmers saved the day for them. And after that, we actually worked with Red Tomato to ship seedless watermelons from Boston, Georgia to Boston, Massachusetts. Now, I could have carried on and, and Ray had a storm raging myself, you know, but I'm telling you, you have to be calm. You have to listen. You have to plot your course. You know that you can't deal with whatever is happening, but you figure a way around it. You figure a way out of it when you come. You can't think clearly when you're, when you're cursing and carrying on like a fool. You gotta calmly look at, okay, I can't do this. So now what else can I do? Who else can I look to, to help me as I, as I move through this? When we lost 6,000 acres of land, the first community land trust, I didn't think I could live beyond it. And in fact, as it was supposed to be sold at the courthouse steps, I actually managed to try to be out of town. And then when we learned that the new owner, owner who got the property at a fifth of what it was worth, um, we learned that he dug holes and pushed all of our buildings over in them. You know, here's again, where you feel that, that you know, what kind of response can you give to this storm? You know, you have so many storms in life. What can you do to move beyond this? That's when I started working on land loss issues and, and other issues of farming with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Um, and then you're encountering there, you know, I'm out in these counties, I'm, I'm working with farmers trying to trying to help them deal with Farmers Home Administration, that racist USDA, and knowing that these farmers couldn't really speak up for themselves. My father spoke up for himself and he died, you know? So I was always aware of that as I would go into an office with a farmer. And I guess I felt fearless some of those times because I got in some very, very dangerous situations as I was moving through the storm of discrimination and racism dealing with our, our people. But again, you have to, you, you kind of know what you can do. You know, I've, I've faced some of those guys in their office and thought at one point, one of them, I thought he was gonna get up and hit me. You know, at another point they had bragged about me not coming into their area. And uh, so I went representing the farmer and wouldn't sit down in the office. I had the woman trembling. But, you know, these are all um, 
actions sometimes um, that you have to do when you seem to always be in a storm, but you don't, you, you, you can work your way out of it. You know, we can see some storms coming. We can see, you know, when they, when they forecast a hurricane, we can track it from wherever it starts all the way to where we are. So you have plenty of time to, to um, prepare for it. Even that preparation might not be enough, but you have plenty of time to get ready for it. But when, you, when you've been dealing with racism and discrimination and the people who have versus those who ha don't have, you know, you just seem to always be in a storm, but you have to stay calm. Um, you know, there was this uh, woman, uh, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, who said, "'Tis the set of the sail that decides the goal and not the storm of life. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. What is it we want? And what do we need to do to get there? Now, one of the things I had to do was show our farmers that we had to work together. I told them all the time, you know, in the day of my grandparents' farm, and yeah, maybe they could stay on that few acres of land and, and make a living for the family. But in the day of my father and those since then, they really need to work together so that everyone can advance. You know, maybe working together to get uh, fertilizer or maybe working together to market a product um, or maybe getting together to plan. You know, agriculture is so different now than the way it used to be. Um, we, the markets, <laughs> Gosh, I remember when Trump became president, one of the first things he did was to put tariffs on China. Now, all of the, most of the pecans, not all, but a lot of the pecans in this country were going to China. You know, I would hear the folks who were doing the marketing say the Chinese people really um, thought that the pecan looked like a brain food. So they loved them. And then here was China putting a tariff, I mean, US putting a tariff on China. And I knew as, a, as smaller pecan growers, we would suffer the most with this. Uh, I guess I should say to you though, before I go there, um, that storm when we lost 6,000 acres and needed to regroup to figure out where do we go from here. That's, and, you know, that's when I started working with farmers across the South, but never stopped looking at what we could do in answer to what had happened to us. Um, and therefore, as we worked on, as I worked on black land loss issues across the South, we knew a lawsuit had to happen. Um, and that lawsuit was filed. We, People always talk about Pickford, but there was one prior to Pickford. And those of us who know that, we really do need to write about it because that's what set the stage for Pickford versus Glickman, the Black Farmers um, lawsuit. I was so busy helping um, farmers because there, here was another storm. I just have to mention this. So the government was offering to settle the lawsuit with Black farmers. And you had some groups that had just started who didn't want to settle. But those of us who had been out there working with these farmers knew that the best thing for us to do was to settle because most of our farmers had not kept the kind of records that were necessary to go to court individually. And um, that, was, that was some storm I, I, I can remember. Um, some of the meetings and some of the things that happened as a result, but we made it through that. And the decision was to settle. Um, farmer, there were A and B classes uh, of uh, farmers in the settlement. But the point I wanna make here is that I was so focused on helping farmers across the South learn about the lawsuit know what they, you know, hear what they needed together in order to get to the attorneys to have a claim file. 
that I completely forgot about our loss. It just had not, you know, it didn't occur to me. I was so busy from Texas all the way back this way. Um, and then driving from Alabama one night, the light bulb went off. Oh my goodness. We were farming in 1981. We can file a claim in the Pickford case. And I can tell you that we did. We met the deadline of October 13th, 1999. Now, can I tell you during a 10 year span that everything was successful? We fought 10 years, we were in a storm. I can tell you that the, the lawyer for the government working with the Justice Department was arrested two years after our hearing in California because she was not a lawyer at all. Yet she was working as a lawyer for the Justice Department. There were many other things that happened during the 10 years. We, you know, they denied us, we appealed. Uh, they had to get someone special to, um, to handle our appeal because I, I was a friend of the monitor who was out of um, Mass uh, Minnesota. And after 10 years in this storm where we, where we didn't know what would happen, we continued with a lot of other work. And then uh, we got a new president who didn't, they didn't know anything about this lawsuit. We, you know, our claim in the Pickford case, but during the beginning of the Clinton uh, presidency, the effort was to try to get me in as the state director of, um, of um, Farmers Home Administration. But Sam Nunn was the senior democratically elected official in the state and he, had, he was having no parts of it. So I was in that struggle for a while. Um, and during that struggle, Kellogg um, actually um, chose me to be a Kellogg fellow. <laughs> so things were, you know, bad things were happening, good things were happening. This storm was just, just raging and you just have to quietly um, move through it if you can't stop it. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't get in. Um, during the Clinton administration and all of a sudden Obama was elected and um, people felt I needed to, my name needed to be put forth again for the position. Um, I kept saying, you know, I'm 15 years older now. Um, I don't know whether this is a good idea or not, but others were not hearing it. So my name went in and then I found it for Farmers Home State Director, of, of the farmer program, Farm Service Agency. And I got a call from my uh, congressman who said, Shirley, when you look at all the work you've been doing, you are a better fit for rural development. I said, okay. I didn't think I would get it anyway, but I thought, you know, yeah, here is another fight where we can't get through that ceiling, but we just have to keep trying. Now, I, you, I've never been one to back off a fight, you know, when it comes to civil rights, I'm with you, you know, I'm there. When I made that commitment in 1965, it's, I've been there fighting ever since. So this was yet another, I didn't think it would happen, but um, on the night of July 8th, we, um, I received the call from our attorney saying we had won well, our claim against Pickford, I mean, against um, USDA in the Pickford case. And we had, we had won an award that was between 12 and $13 million. Just totally unbelievable. You know, now we, when they took 6,000 acres, now we were being given a chance to try to get more land. We couldn't get that land, but we could look for more land. And then on the night of July 30th, 30th all in the same month, I received a call from the White House saying I had been selected as state director of, I mean, yeah, as state director, Georgia State Director of Rural Development. Y'all, I mean, the storm had come, but I was about as full of a storm as you could get. <laughs> All in the same month. 
now we have a chance to restart new communities and now they've been asking they're asking me to come to the state office but i quickly uh, decided to accept it because i didn't know when we would ever have the opportunity to break that barrier down again now i was having the opportunity to lead the agency when my father applied for a farmer's home loan to build a house he was told a black man couldn't borrow the money to build a brick house that if you want to borrow money to build a home it has to be the block of wood and now here i was all of these years later now directing that program for the state of georgia you know god is so good and if you stay true to your calling if you if you if you do all that you can to to do what you can you know for for your people to advance the work and so forth things begin to happen they're not all good sometimes but but you get movement and so here i was directing now the program that denied my father the right to build the kind of house he could, he borrowed the money but he couldn't build the kind of home he wanted and I was being placed in a position where I could now help direct funding to uh, our people, housing, you know, you the sewage in these small towns, you know, community facilities. It's the only agency that could build a whole town. So you could build schools, you know, the whole nine yards that can be done with rural development funding. So I had to pivot because my mind was first on let's get going with new communities again and now i've got to go and work for rural development 200 miles the state office is 200 miles from my home uh, but i jumped into it i jumped into it like i have done all of the work i've tried to do through the years i give it all that i have and that's what i was doing when i made a speech to um uh, um, NAACP organization in a town here in Georgia. It was taped. They were showing it on TV. Breitbart was against um, Obama. He decided to take my speech and, and cut and splice to make it appear that as a government official, I was refusing to help a white farmer. Y'all, if the storm wasn't, when that hit the news on July the 19th, 2010, you talking about a storm. This was one of the bigger storms. The biggest one was losing my father. And this comes up there right next to it. I wasn't even in the office. I was in another part of the state meeting uh, in the town where um, the Kia plant is located. But the storm was raging. And uh, I called to Washington to tell them that not only, first of all, they knew that uh, rural development would not have been trying to help a farmer save his farm. With rural development, the only way we worked with farmers is if they were adding value to something they grew. You couldn't even make a production loan to a farmer. Or if he was building a home, you know, that would come through rural development, but not trying to use rural development money to save a farm, but they didn't care. You know, I was trying to explain to them that, that the farmer I've talked about through the years, um, the white farmer I was talking about, um, we became very good friends. They have the farm today because of what I did to help them. No one wanted to hear that storm was really, really raging. Uh, in fact, they told me I was being placed on administrative leave. And I had to drive three and a half hours from where I was back to the office. So an hour into the drive, they are saying to me, um, where are you now? I said, you know, I have a long, long way to go. And I'm still trying to get them to understand that I helped that farmer 24 years ago. Cause that's, that was, <laughs> that, you know, it was, um, I, I had recounted something that happened 24 years earlier during that speech. Breitbart made it appear that it had just happened. Uh, as I was going through Atlanta, heavy traffic, um, they called me again and said the White House wanted me to resign. And, and before I could get to 
Athens. They asked me to pull to the side of the road and use my Blackberry to submit my letter of resignation. Now this is a busy four lane highway between Atlanta and Athens, Georgia. But I, I told them I'm gonna do it because all this time I'm thinking about what effect this is having on Obama, the first black president. But I said, you haven't heard the last from me. Now the storm was raging in me, but I calmly said to them, you haven't heard the last from me. And I meant that. If I had to tell one person for the rest of my life, um, the truth, I intended to do that. But, you know, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, I made it through that night. The next day, because I drove home after getting to Athens, which was a four and a half hour drive. And uh, getting home after midnight, the next morning, my yard is full of all of these networks, even the satellite truck from CNN. You talking about a storm, but I just calmly gave interviews. I'm telling the truth. I agreed to do an interview for CNN in my house. Um, and as I was on the air, the guy said something and I stopped talking. He said, we have someone here. And it was the wife of the white farmer. They didn't know whether they were the farmers I was talking about or not, but they were calling in to CNN to say what I did for them and to say they wouldn't have the farm today if it had not been for what I did. Now, you all probably kept up with it some back then, but I can tell you that was a storm. But you have, you have to, you can't, I know they expected me to be that um, black woman that was raging and all, but I would calmly, I didn't have to worry about on each interview what I was saying, because I was telling the truth, you know, and the truth came out like a couple of days later, even the NAACP condemned me. And then when they listened to the whole tape, they realized they had been snookered and um, they, they apologized. And then some of the leadership came a few days later to apologize in person. But I can tell you, you can't think straight if, you, if you're getting angry, you know, if, you, if you're acting like a mad person, uh, you gotta calmly think about next steps. What do I need to do now? Now they offered me a new position. There was no way I would go back and work for you. Well, I, I say that they didn't offer my same job. I had a lot of things going there. In fact, they sent me a letter shortly after uh, my dismissal to say that they had pulled the record for Georgia and I was able to get three times more money into persistently poor counties in Georgia than they had done the previous eight years. And I had only been there 11 months. So, um, as we move in to these storms, you need to stay abreast of all of the things you need to know. You can't assume you know everything. You know, talk to, to people who have been in this work for years. You need to make connections. I pushed farmers. You know, I, I would get farmers together in one county and then I would get them to work together across counties. And then the big thing at some point was to get them to not just deal with, 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 with the ones in their circle. I tell them, okay, now it's time for us to go to Alabama to the Federation's annual meeting. You know, and I say, I say to them, I said, sometime you may be sitting up there in the meeting and a cow go by the window or something else will happen, trying to get them to understand how rural it was, you know, and, and that they were not going over to be in some big hotel uh, where things were so nice. And uh, the other thing, the other one other point I wanna make um, is that when you care about your people, when you care about the work, People, the people you're working with who need your help can feel that, you know, and they will, I used to tell groups here all the time, farmers will work together. They gotta know that they have to look at you as a resource. You know, they could feel 
the love I had for them and the concern I had for them because I went to bat for so many of them. You know, it's a wonder I would have myself in some dangerous situations standing up to these white men in these offices because I knew the farmer couldn't speak, but I was free to speak. So I was free to say what needed to be said. Um, I also pushed them to, you know, where I took the time to try to learn the regulations so I would know when things were being said that shouldn't, that were not true. You know, I could challenge the folks in those offices on it. I wanted the farmers to know too, so that they could, could um, begin to speak for themselves. And that happened through the years. But in those early years, they were afraid that what little they were getting would be cut off if they stood up or they could be killed like my father was because he stood up to the white man, you know, who was trying to take some of his cows. Um, but when you truly um, care, it comes through, you know, so that's a storm you can, where you can help keep the, the waters calm and, and to calm the winds as you, as you go through um, this work. There's so much, I don't want to just keep going and on, but there is so much, you know, when you've been out here working um, 55, almost 56 years, um, you know there's a lot to share. There were many, many dangerous situations, but God was with me and I felt his presence, um, you know, so I, I worked to stand up for our folks until they could stand up for themselves to move on. Um, I can say to you, they took 6,000 acres from us. Um, and I, I'd say it this way, God gave us a plantation that's intact. Now we were not going out looking for a plantation, but in looking for more land, we found land, I'm sitting maybe six miles from where it is now. It, the property line comes right up to where the city of city limits of Albany begins. And that land, we learned the, the history of it. The land was once owned by the largest slave owner and the wealthiest man in the state of Georgia back in the 1800s. He held, he owned about nine plantations and held the largest number of slaves at this site. Um, he, it changed hands over the years. We have an ad showing where 150 slaves were sold from that plantation on December the 29th, 1859. I was taking someone through that antebellum house today and I told him that Jefferson Davis spent five nights in that house when he was running from the Union Army. We know that because he gave a dinner party and that was documented. You know, I could go on and on about this piece of property that we have in our hands and the things we want to, to do from there. I can tell you too that we still have a relationship with Red Tomato. They are actually um, marketing our pecans and, we, and, and oranges. Uh, so we, we have kept that relationship. That's important as you go through these storms. You never know when um, you've developed friendships that you need to call on through the years. You can't do it all yourself. You need to network. You need to help others and they can help you. Um, that's part of, of, of what we do in a storm. Sometimes when in a storm, our neighbor is hit and we aren't. Sometimes we're hit and the neighbor is not hit. And we just have to get in there to work to help each other. And that's what this is all about. Whether you're in the, in the city, in the urban area, or in the rural area, we need to make that connection happen more and more. It's very important as we move forward. We, you know, you have these big guys, these big farmers and USDA seems to be all about them. And you probably know that um, Tom Vilsack was um, nominated to be the secretary of ag again. And there are a lot of people who were against that or are against that, that nomination, but um, in everything that I do, I, I dwell on it, I pray on it, and I assume he's gonna get it whether black folks 
uh, oppose it or not. We need to go after this to get the most that we can out of it. So I actually came out, well, he and I had talked in earlier years. Hillary Clinton had considered him as her running mate. She probably would have made it if she had had him because he represented rural areas. But, but I think because of what happened with me and USDA, they didn't choose him, but he had called me before that. And I told him, you don't have a problem with me. When you said you were sorry, I accepted it and we move on. And that's the way I do with anyone. You know, we have too much work to do. So this rural urban uh, connection, we need to make more of it. And I say to people in the city, you do a very good job of growing food, but you won't ever be able to grow enough to feed everybody. So you really have to work together rural and urban so that we can make sure there are no poor people, no, no hungry people is what I want to say, and hopefully no poor people uh, around. So I guess I need to stop here and uh, wait for some questions. <laughs> I could just listen to you all night. Um, oh. I'm just like so full of gratitude right now for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. And um, you, you just give us so much courage and oh. inspiration and so much hope. And I'm just, I'm so grateful for you, mama. Um, you. I wanted to, you know, I, um, I wanted to shout out like, and oh, you can't see it, but um, Mama Sherrod wrote The Courage to Hope and you all should definitely, definitely get this book. It's really powerful. And hearing the stories again, like, you know, I, I got goosebumps again. Um, <laughs> and just um, thank you. We need this right now. We need this and we're so grateful. I wanted to let you know that your friend Michael Rosine is on tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> from so Michael um, actually connected Mama Sherrod and I, and um, we're so grateful for that. And Michael also happens to be um, one of, well, he is um, one of the former uh, original Nissan board members. So that's just awesome. Um, and just real quick, because I didn't, get to shout out um, the other board members there. You got to see uh, Dr. Heber and we've got um, Becca Williams and Gary Blast and Noel Warfer and Alum and Kelsey Watson. And, mm -hmm. um, and so y'all are all on here. Our entire staff is on here. People were like, we are not going to miss Mrs. Sherrod. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I don't want to hold us up any longer. Uh, we, um, my coworker, my friend, and the policy manager for NISOG, Nicole Sugarman, is going to lead us in the Q&A for, um, for this evening. So Nicole, whenever you're ready, please take it away in this um, moderated Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Malika. Um, and I don't want to waste a single second because I'm sure we will have so many questions for Mrs. Sherrod. Um, um, Mrs. Sherrod, I would like to thank you so much for that inspiring talk and for your incredible um, and long service as a leader in this movement. Um, there's been a few questions submitted for Mrs. Sherrod in the Q&A, and I'm sure this amazing group that we have on the call have lots more questions for Mrs. Sherrod, so please continue submitting them through the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I may unmute some people to uh, ask your own questions because I'd love to get as many voices in the room as possible, but just please be aware of time because we want to get to lots of folks' questions and we want to hear Mrs. Sherrod talk about as many things as um, we have time for. So um, the first question we got in is from Iris. And Iris, I'm going to allow you to talk and invite you to unmute if you'd like to ask your question. Hello, can I be heard? Yes. Uh, greetings, everyone. Ms. Shirley Sherrod, I really appreciate you sharing your experience. It was, you know, how you, people can say something and you lighten your burden just a little bit. That's what you did for me. Uh -uh. Um, but I, I'm in a rural area in Wisconsin. Um, I don't have many connections. I'm a new farmer. 
And I want to know from you if you're not, if you feel uncomfortable in a in a setting that's supposedly you know your peers, how do you get comfort to engage? I guess. Yeah, I've always tried to look. Um, well, start you 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 start with one person. <laughs> in that in that group of people that you're you're trying to become engaged with um just start a conversation and you'd be surprised at what that conversation leads to um that's how i've gotten people to to look at um forming a co-op or working together um you have to start with one individual to become comfortable to move out with the others. I know in the rural area, people have been so used to being on their own or doing things themselves, but you can break through that. Um, just simply picking one and trying to get a conversation started. And from that, you can talk about some of the things you all could do together. Great. Thank you so much, Iris, for the question. And thank you, Mrs. Sherrod, for your response. Um, the second question we have is from Erica Hall. Um, Erica, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk, and then you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Ms. Sherrod, uh, because of people like you, we stand on your shoulders. So first, let me just thank you for all of your contributions and just as a leader in this space and in this movement. What I would like to ask is, do you think the Justice for Black Farmers Act of 2020 will pass that was uh, written by Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, and Christian Gillibrand? And my second part of the question is, will David Scott, who's now the chair of the House Ag Committee, be effective? Okay, on the first one, you know, when I told you I try to try to read and listen to as many things that I can to, to um, help with the work that I do, um, I always try to listen to the farm report. And I just happened to have listened to that uh, on Saturday. And one of the things they did uh, was to talk about that bill. And um, <laughs> it was very interesting. I guess you have a lot of Farm Bureau people and others who, who, um, who helped to make up that, that farm show. But the guy who was talking gave it no chance of passing. And then he said, um, to give uh, black people 160 acres of land, first of all, that's too much, that's not enough land to do the farming that's, that's needed. I mean, I just wish you could have heard it. And I realized this is some of, of um, the arguments and the backlash we are gonna get as we push for passage of the bill. I would hope it could pass, but listening to stuff like that, it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, I'm so sorry, I got so into that, I forgot the second part of your question. Yes, the second part of my question was David Scott, who oh, will be the oh, chair yes. of the House Ag Committee. I know you know him, you both go way back but do you think, and I heard him speak, and he said that his priorities was climate change, food insecurities, and getting this bill for Black farmers passed. So do you think he'll be effective in that role? Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just wish David Scott had done more to reach out to groups like ours. He's there in Atlanta. You know, and one of the things I, I plan to do is push him as soon as this virus is no longer the threat that it is to come down here and meet with some farmers in his state, if nowhere else. You know, I, I as a, you know, anyway, I, I, my answer is I don't know. <laughs> I won't go into it more, but I don't have a lot of hope there with him. Let's hope they will, you know, let's hope I'll be proven wrong. 
Thank you so much, Erica, for your questions. And thank you, Mrs. Shad, for your answer. Um, the next question we have is from Ulum, who uh, doesn't um, want to ask out loud because she has a baby with her. But <laughs> um, <laughs> Ulum says she's so inspired by this conversation. She's also a woman of color in this work and a fourth generation farmer. Um, mm -hmm. Ulum's people were gatherers before that, indigenous Maya. So as a migrant farm worker and owner trying to organize other farmers like me, what would be your advice? Um, and she says, thank you again for your teachings. Thanks for the great spirit for your elder knowledge and courage, it's so much needed. Well, one of the things you have to do, you know, I would, I would try to learn everything I could. I, I would f find things about housing or about something else that I thought my people, information they would need. I took the time to learn regulations. You know, you, you, you have these computers, you really need to study these um, USDA programs. Um, you, because in a lot of cases, um, they know what you qualify for, but not going to tell you. You know, so if you don't know to ask, you don't get it. And that goes way back to the old ASCS committees and all, where white farmers would get the information, access the programs, and by the time black farmers knew about them, all of the money would be gone. So you have to arm yourself with information that can be helpful. It'll be easy to organize people when they feel you are a resource for them. And they will, you know, I used to tell them, I said, I would say, you know, I'm here for you, but when I need you to go to the Federation's annual meeting, that's when you show me that appreciation. I didn't ever have a problem. I ended up with having to raise money for a bus to take people over there to the boondocks and in after Alabama. But it was easy to make that happen because people look to me as a resource to help them get through the storms they were dealing with. Thank you. That's incredible advice. Um, we next have a question from the Institute of Afrofuturist Ecology. Um, so I'm going to unmute you right now. Good evening. Thank you so much, Queen Mother Sherrod. Uh, my name is Jasmine. I'm the Executive Director of Institute of Afrofuturist Ecology. Uh, on our advisory board is Demetria Royals, one of your fellows from the Kellogg Foundation. Mm -hmm. My question tonight is about organizing as African American land workers uh, amongst a larger network of uh, Africans in the diaspora and on the continent regarding sharing, to share our experience, our knowledge, and to use our collective power to access opportunity for the future. Our work, uh, we have a 300 year vision. And so a lot of the issues that we are still facing uh, as a people in this work, working close to the land. You know, a lot of these issues are inherited generation after generation. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, as you know, in the continent of Africa, there's like a, a third, a quarter of the world's uh, fertile arable land and a third of the world's natural resources, gold, oil, minerals and such are uh, there on the land. And we have neo-colonialism happening today where uh, China and various uh, foreign entities are coming in to colonize and take control and seize control of the land and keep uh, Black farmers on the land in perpetual state of want and need. And so my question today, as we are um, invited to build a campus there, and we hope to be a bridge for Africans who are seeking refuge from anti-Black racism in the United States, Mm -hmm. Many of them would like to and or are currently developing agricultural projects uh, in a strategy for economic empowerment for all of us. Do you have any ideas, any resources, any suggestions, or in, you know, any inspirations around African in the America, in the Americas connecting to the land and, and farmers and on the continent of Africa. I wish I could say more to you there, but um, again, the, the, the way I've operated is I say to 
to our people who don't seem to have much, but when when it comes to trying to make a little bit go a long way, um, they figure out how to do it. So I say to them, first, you, do, you need to do what you can do. You know, don't wait for somebody. If you're waiting, in fact, where I went to school um, was one of those separate but, in, uh, separate but supposedly equal uh, buildings that they threw up in Georgia to keep from integrating the schools. When that school was closing because they were building a new one in 2000, I said to the folks, let's save that building so that we don't stand here and say once they stood one of those separate but equal uh, schools, they can see it, it's working for the community. I said, but we can't stand here and wait on someone else to come with the money to do what we need to do. So I, that's, a, you know, I work from that, that belief. And uh, so connecting folks here with that belief and folks there, you know, we don't need to wait until someone brings a lot of money so we can make the connection. We do need to figure out how to make that connection, what kind of um, crops that can be grown, grown uh, there, what kind of crops, you know, I, I really don't have the answer for that. I can just talk about, you know, what I believe and how I work in uh, making connections across um, counties and states. I'm sorry, I can't do more with that. Thank you both so much. Um, I think we may have time for one, maybe two more questions. So I'm apologizing in advance to those we didn't get to, um, but I'm going to go ahead and let Rashid um, ask her question live or their question. Rashid, are you able to unmute yourself? Um, okay, in the interest of time, I think I will ask Rashid's question. Um, Rashid is wondering, what was the formation of the land trust like? Any particular things you feel that you did really well um, that you'd like to highlight and any challenges? Yeah, in addition to trying to make sure the land would be there, we felt forever and ever because we would give, our plan was to give long-term renewable leases. We talked about how to work with each other. You know, people don't usually ask me about that um, because, you know, they, they blocked any federal money coming to us. We started farming, but we operated, um, we had a farm committee that met every Monday night and all of us had one vote. Now we had a farm manager. We understood we had to follow his, uh, whatever he said needed to be done based on the plans that we made during the week. But on Monday night, we had a chance to question everything and to put new ideas and, and so forth on the table. We, we, we worked from that standpoint, everybody had a voice. And, and everybody had a vote and everybody had a say in how we would move forward together. That's something people don't normally ask me, but that was also part of, of the land trust. Great, um, I think we may, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and try to squeeze in Carol. Um, Carol, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you now and you can ask your question and this will be definitely the last question. Thank you very much. Um, so I come from an island in the Caribbean which is consecutively hit by storms. Uh, they are natural, political, economical, social, etc. And I appreciated the comparison that Mrs. Sherrod made with the consecutive storms that hit particular communities in the US. And I think that if we think about it this way, we could, grow, we could draw a bridge of empathy, of lessons learned, inspiration, uh, and so on how to deal with these many types of storms in these regions. And I wanted to ask what motivated you to use this concept and what we can learn from naming these events uh, as storms. Yeah. Um. 
I just always like to, you know, the, the, this whole thing about uh, surviving a storm, you know, the, the, the whole issue is about survival and we can figure that out. Uh, as we move forward. And I'm, I'm glad to hear, um, I've always wanted to con connect more with uh, farmers in the Caribbean area. I've actually gone down to um, work with women in, um, oh gosh, next to Haiti. <laughs> country i don't know why i'm drawing such a blank there as much as i've said it the two the haiti and the dominican republic you know i've actually gone down and, and worked with the women there i didn't speak spanish and really regretted it i had to tell the young man who was uh interpreting for me you know i'm telling him a story about the struggles women have in trying to organize and working with men and he's away and so i'm telling how my husband had a problem with some of that at one point. He's going to stop and tell me, why don't you go on and finish this so that they'll know that you and Sherrod are still together. And I'm having to say, why don't you let me tell this the way I want to? <laughs> but I've always wanted to connect and I want us to connect. And, and for the person who asked the question before, I'd be very interested in, in uh, hearing more about your work and, and trying to be a part of it. Okay, and that will close us out. Thank you so much again, Mrs. Sherrod, um, for your incredible leadership and work. Um, and thank you so much to our participants for these amazing questions. Um, Malika highlighted before a few of the ways participants can stay involved in the SOG's work. Um, I'm gonna put my uh, email in the, in the chat one more time um, and folks should please reach out for any uh, policy support um, or collaboration ideas. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Reverend Brown to um, close us out. Um, real quick, Shia, can you go back to uh, that last slide so people are able to get in touch with Mrs. Sherrod? And if you um, are so moved, please gen um, donate to her project. And here's the information here. Um, and that ways that you can do connect with Mrs. Sherrod after this. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sherrod. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and brother. Malika, do you mind also talking about the next uh, event coming up? So folks can kind of plug in. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, yes, so on February 23rd, we will have our own Brandy Brooks, who is going to rock the Sankofa series. So mark your calendars. Um, you'll be getting information soon about this, but we hope that you all can join us. Brandy's on here tonight. So hey, Brandy, we can't wait till uh, you're presenting and <laughs> we're really excited. Thank you all for showing up tonight. And um, Brother Heber has some beautiful news to share with everyone. Absolutely. Family, guess what happened tonight? You remember during offering time a little bit earlier before our <laughs> preacher tonight, uh, I, I shared that we had a goal of $500. Well, let me tell you what y'all did. Uh, tonight, we've raised $975 in support of our youth programming and our young people. And we just wanted to say thank you. You know, I'm just, I, I got, uh, I'm, I'm from I was born in Baltimore, Mrs. Sherrod, uh, but I got country roots. I got home training from <laughs> Eastern North Carolina in the Greenville area, a little town called Aiden, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and also in rural Virginia. And my grandmother always told me, you say thank you when someone has done something nice for you. So family, I wanna say thank you on behalf of the Nissan board and staff for your support in exceeding our goal of $500 and it is the Black Baptist preacher in me that says, we so close to a thousand. I mean, we, we're just that close. We <laughs> like big, even numbers. And so if anyone else feels so moved, especially after this dynamic presentation, uh, we certainly would love for your support. Uh, we're just a few dollars away from a clean thousand. And I just believe we can, especially after this talk tonight, I believe we can do it. Go to nissog.org forward slash donate. And let's go ahead and make history tonight together after this presentation. Now, look, before we go, 
right over here over my shoulder is a uh, Sankofa bird. Uh, the bird looking backwards with the egg in its mouth, which literally means go back and fetch. And it's not wrong to go back and fetch what you need in order to move forward. Mrs. Sherrod, mm -hmm. I cannot thank you enough for taking us on a Sankofa journey. I felt like I was in a time machine uh, <laughs> as you took us chapter by chapter. I needed it. A dear friend of mine, Dr. Melanie Harris, uh, writes about eco-womanism and she talks about the importance of eco-memory, of, of recalling so that we can be reminded that we really do have more in our hand uh, mm -hmm. than we even realize sometimes. Can I ask all of you family tonight or listening to this, normally a benediction would come down. Can we do the benediction together? Can you type and benediction is just a final prayer or a closing blessing? After all that we this evening, do you mind sharing one word which describes how you feel right now? And let that be our closing prayer and benediction. Just what's one word that after hearing Mr. Sherrod tonight, it just, it just bubbles up in you. I see the word grateful. I see grounded. I see inspired. I see empowered. I see love. I see encouraged. I see connection, I see proud, I see free, I see focused, I see educated, I see admiring, I see possibility. We see inspired, we see love tonight. We see awesome, we feel awesome. What an amazing benediction. Together we provided the closing blessing on such a powerful night. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to grab my journal when I log off of here because all of these blessings y'all just put in this chat box, I want to have it flow into the pages of my journal so that it's not easily forgotten and we don't rush off to just another Zoom. This is holy ground. And so take a deep breath once we log off and just soak up more of what we've received tonight. Well, if there's no more, uh, com, uh, updates. Let's stay connected and let's continue to pray for, send good vibes and energy to Mrs. Sherrod and all of her very important work. She is, as one of the commenters said, a queen mother of this movement and we bow in deep, bow in deep gratitude. Thank you again, Mrs. Sherrod, for your love Thank for you. your teaching and lessons. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, everybody. Have a great night. God bless okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you guys so much. Good night, family. Thank you so much. Beautiful, beautiful.